Welcome again, everyone. We are really, really delighted to have you here. Uh, my name is Kat Davis. I'm co-founder of Flip Finance and a passionate advocate of systems change. I will be acting as host this evening, which um, this event has been put together with a talented team, including Isabel Nessie and Lisa Huff-Stewart from the Wellbeing Economy Alliance and Laura McKenzie from Caroline Lucas MP's office. Just to let you know, we are recording this event. So if you prefer not to be captured in the recording, please switch your cameras off. Otherwise, we'd encourage you to leave them on. So we are excited to have you here and for the inspiring contributors we have with us this evening to explore what the gender equal economy could look like with well-being at its core. I think you've heard me say that a few times now, we're really passionate about this. But before we hear from our contributors, I wanted to share with you a bit about why we convened this event. Earlier this year, a brilliant young person from Brighton, Skylar Sharples, started an official parliamentary petition calling for the UK government to shift a well-being economy to an economy that puts health and well-being of people and the planet first rather than living within an economy that is primarily fixated on short-term profits and growth. Skylar is a recent graduate and co-founder of Wellbeing Economics Brighton, and in, the, and in their words, we need the government to pursue a well-being economy approach because a narrow focus on GDP has led us to environmental health and financial crises. And as host of the COP26 Climate Summit, the UK government should build and champion a well-being economy at home and globally. Well put indeed. As of this afternoon, the petition is up to almost 55,000 signatures. Now 100,000 signatures are needed by the 26th of September to trigger a major Commons debate. Anyone who is in the UK, either as resident or citizen, can sign this petition. If you haven't signed the petition already, you know what to do. So we're here this evening to focus more specifically on female and non-binary perspectives and what economic systems change means for women. We are joined by Dr. Melena Books, Anna Fielding, Denisha Kilo, Noni Makuen, Caroline Lucas MP and Mandu Reid. We'll also be hearing up front from Catherine Trebek, co-founder of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance Wheel. By the end of this event, we truly hope that you will know that the economy touches our lives in many ways and how much you already know about the need for change through the story shared by our contributors and your fellow members of the audience, and that we can and must change the economic system, and that you will also feel optimistic and energized by your agency to change the economic system. And to also share the petition and engage as many people as possible, as well as yourselves, in pursuing well being economy. To orientate everyone on what to expect and when, first we'll begin with an introduction to what is meant by a well-being economy. Secondly, we'll move into hearing reflections from our four leaders at the forefront of economic systems change and explore what a gender equal economy with well-being at its core could look like. Immediately after this, you'll hear reflections from our first keynote listener, Caroline Lucas. As an elected and active member of parliament, Caroline will need to step out to join voting on the elections bill and she'll be back with us as soon as her duties allow. The middle section is where we'll ask you to share your stories relating to how we can collectively create a new economy. And fourth, we'll hear from our second keynote listener, Mandy Reid, reflecting on the contributions of our four speakers, as well as your stories. And finally, we'll open up to a formal Q&A session where you'll get to ask your questions to the whole panel, both speakers and listeners. So what is a well-being economy? Dr. Catherine Trebek is here to share with you her response to this question. Catherine is writer, researcher, and advocate for economic systems change. She's both co-founder and strate senior strategic advisor for WHEEL. Her expertise is firmly underlined by her co-authored book, The Economics of Arrival, Ideas for a Grown-Up Economy. Her professional highlights include instigating the global group of well-being economy governments and developing Oxford's Oxfam's Humankind Index. Catherine, 
over to you. Uh, thank you so much. And my huge gratitude to everyone behind making this event happen. I couldn't be more excited to be here today. It's, it's such a wonderful event. Bear with me. I've just got stupid messages from Google. Always bad timing. Um, my brief is just to give you the briefest insight to how we think about a wellbeing economy. And at its most basic, I, I think wellbeing economy is about daring to ask why. Why are food banks rising prior to COVID in a rich country like the UK? Why is there rising levels of in-work poverty, rising levels of stress and anxiety? Why are we pumping so much damage onto the planet? And look upstream and focus on the changes that are needed there, rather than thinking that helping people and planet survive and cope with the damage the economic system does to them, vital though that is, that's essentially a humanitarian response, so we should never say it's unimportant. But I think the wellbeing economy agenda is saying we can do better than that. We can aim higher and look upstream at the structure of the economic system. So essentially it's about designing the economy so that it delivers social justice in all its dimensions, vertical and horizontal inequalities. And we're talking about gender justice today, but all so many other dimensions of social justice on a healthy planet. And that requires us to repurpose the economy, being fair weather friends of economic growth rather than its ever faithful followers that we've seen over the last few decades, getting our heads around the difference between means and ends and positioning the economy as in service of that higher order goal of social justice on a healthy planet. It's about ensuring the system and the economy within that is preventative, so designing the economy in a way that stops harm happening in the first place, rather than necessitating all that patching, repairing, cleaning up, helping people cope with the fallout of an economic system that isn't delivering the goods. And this is things like government budgets, outcomes oriented, longer term thinking. And finally, it's about being pre, pre distributive rather clunky term but it's essentially about asking the economy to do more of the heavy lifting in delivering the outcomes we want in terms of equality and sustainability these is questions around ownership of economic structures design of business what sort of business models it's about community wealth building so generating those local economic multipliers from the bottom up about how do we price things are we incorporating the true cost cost of the care economy cost of the environment into the prices and finally it's about ensuring that the economy is participatory putting people at the heart of that essentially ensuring that the economy serves humanity rather than the other way around that's it from me Kat and I'm so excited to hear what everyone else has got to say thanks for being here everyone it's so great to see all your smiling faces thanks Catherine thank you so much so uh, on to our main speakers uh, for their reflections we've asked our four speakers to share their reflections in response to the following question based on your lived experience what drives you to do the work you do how would you like to see this experience change as we co-create a well-being economy and what are the key levers for change needed to make such a transition possible so without further ado i introduce our first speaker dr melena books and uh, melena is associate professor in sustainability economics and low carbon transition at the school of earth and environment at the university of leeds her current research focuses on climate change and inequality, fair climate policies and sustainable welfare. Milena has led and collaborated on several major interdisciplinary UK research and innovation grants, including the notable and current UK Centre for Research into Energy Demand and Solutions. Milena, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Kat and everyone who organised this event. Hi to everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining this event. Um, first, I'd really like to say how excited I am about the Wellbeing Economy Petition. Um, I think it's a very much needed initiative and I really hope that many more people will sign it and that we get to the 100,000 mark. So yeah, please, please do add your signature if you haven't yet. Um, I'm excited about this petition because I think we really need to move away from an economic system 
that prioritizes growth to one that prioritizes human and ecological well-being, as Catherine has already said, and especially in the global north. So I'm an academic, and so in my day job, I try to contribute to this shift to a well-being economy because I think the system that we currently have just doesn't deliver. The current system is based on the exploitation of other human beings and of nature. It's based on competition and short-term short thinking and all the other bad things that uh, Catherine has mentioned. So. How does all this then connect to the role that women play in the economy? And yeah, as uh, Kat has explained, uh, we've been asked to reflect on this question based on our lived experience as a female. I had to actually uh, think about that question quite hard, but I think for me personally, that's actually mainly my work experience. Um, I feel very lucky to work in a department that is quite collegial and that has been co-led by women for the last four years and absolutely brilliantly so. Um, but if I look at my wider work environment, I see a bunch of other things going on. Of course, the higher you go into the university hierarchy, the fewer women you will see, and many university subjects remain highly gendered. And work in academia is also highly competitive and quite stressful, often with pretty insane working hours. And what mainly counts is often the sheer amount of research money that you win, uh, the number of papers that you publish, and how often they get cited. So whether the work makes a useful contribution to improve society often seems secondary. And that's, I think, really connected to the trend of running universities more and more like businesses rather than uh, institutions that serve a public value. And in some places, there can be quite toxic hierarchies at universities where those in powerful positions exploit or bully those who are lower down the pecking order. So I think all of these examples are actually symptomatic of the economic system that surrounds us. And what I would like to see instead are universities and economic systems, and obviously other organizations as well, that value quality over quantity and in which we have much healthier relationships to other people, to ourselves, and of course, to nature as well. So I'd like to see a workplace and an economy in which everyone feels valued and has the same real opportunities, regardless of their gender, ethnicity, social background, etc. So how can we make this happen? And would it help to have a greater gender balance in organizations and more women in leadership positions? My answer, quite evidently, hopefully, uh, to that question is definitely yes. But I'm not saying this because I believe that women are by nature somehow different to men. Um, yes, it's true. Women are often seen as more caring, more collaborative and more emotionally intelligent than men. But I think in many ways, it's our divided economic and social system that is actually creating and constantly maintaining these sorts of differences. And if that is right, then I think that means that more men should basically become more caring, collaborative and emotionally intelligent too. Um, but it also means that they are able to do so. And this can happen if we change the underlying economic system and giving women a greater role to play in the system needs to be a very important part of that. So just to give you an example, a year ago, we got a new vice chancellor at my university and they have started a completely new discourse around values, around collegiality and work-life balance. And guess what? Um, she is a woman. And of course, I think it's also not maybe a coincidence that four of the current five well-being economy governments are also led by women. So that makes me think uh, women are perhaps better able to take innovative positions and lead change because you know, for women to play a bigger role in the economy still challenges the current order. And so this is the thought that I would like to end on, um, that women can make a massive contribution to creating a well-being economy because we can challenge conventional economic wisdoms and existing cultures of exploitation and competition on which the current system is built. So I think for women, the key to changing the system is to avoid adopting the same types of character traits, behaviors, 
and ways of economic thinking that men in powerful positions often exhibit. So women need to challenge these behaviors and these cultures and having more women do this will be a very important part of changing the economic system. Thank you, I'll leave it here. Thank you, Milena. And thank you again, everyone, for joining and so many from around the world. Uh, just to explain that the speakers are all in the UK because of the UK uh, petition to ask the UK government to put wellbeing ec economics uh, into uh, UK uh, priorities. But of course, what we're discussing is relevant everywhere. So now on to our second speaker, uh, Denisha Kilo. Denisha is a trustee and core team member at Wheel Scotland and the lead of the Scottish Government funded National Childhood Bereavement Project delivered by Includem. Denisha has dedicated her personal and professional life to amplifying the voices of those who come from marginalised backgrounds to shift power structures and create transformational long term sustainable change. So, uh, an excellent segue from what uh, Milena has just been saying now about those in position of power. So, Denisha, over to you. Thank you. I uh, just want to first by say thank you for everyone for coming today. It's so nice to see so many people from across the world. I think it's great to have this discussion. Um, and I think when I was asked the questions, um, I reflected quite a lot of growing up in Scotland and what was the turn of the centuries and coming into the 21st century and how it's granted me access to numerous opportunities that I would have been excluded from in a previous life. I've voted in every election since I turned 16, which is obviously unique to Scotland. Um, I graduated from university with a degree in politics and social policy last year. And as a granddaughter of a Windrush immigrant and an openly LGBT woman, these are things that would have been impossible for someone like me to do in a previous generation. But just because I've got greater opportunities to make my voice heard in today's society, and that doesn't mean that my voice is always listened to and respected. And as someone with intersectional identities, I feel this on multiple levels. And I think why today is so important to me is because this isn't a case in a wellbeing economy. Everyone is valued for who they are and what they bring to the table. And I think that's really, really important when we reflect on how we grant equal access to power and democracy without addressing the root causes of inequity, because we only reinforce systemic barriers, particularly in relation to gender, race, class, sexuality, and ability. We know those who set the rules of the game shape the structures that govern us. And when we look at the backgrounds of those who hold power in society, the fields with the greatest influence are predominantly dominated by the pale male and stale and have been designed by them to serve them. As our institutions have been built upon the foundations of unequal power structures, they have not been set up to reconstruct inequality, nor were they made to empower marginalised communities. A system set up to benefit the few cannot be trusted to act in the best interest of many. This is a key problem with our current economy. It acts through tunnel vision, chasing growth and riches through any means necessary, even at the cost of our collective well-being. We see this when we look at the rise of billionaires coupled with the rise of food banks, the increase of man-made artificial islands sold at holiday destinations at the cost of destruction to natural sea life and habitats. When decisions about how our society looks and acts are made with only a few people with power and privilege around the table, drawing from their own worldview, experiences and understanding, there will always be negative consequences for the most marginalised communities. Even the most well-read and well-meaning individuals can never be a substitute for true diversity and lived experience. At its core, this is what a wellbeing economy delivers. It redesigns our institutions from the ground up, putting those who bear the brunt of deprivation and inequality of our current system in flex in the driving seats as architecture of their future, rather than the passive recipients of decisions taken elsewhere without their interests at heart. As someone who has felt first-hand effects of this through my own experiences of discrimination and hardship, and second-hand through my family's experiences of colonisation and de deprivation, it's a phenomenal honour to be here today and be part of this mission to deliver a wellbeing economy. I'm thankful for you all to be here as well, to hear this and listen to everything that the speakers have got to say today, in the hope that the world can be better than it is right now. And I guess if I've got one ask for you all today to take something away, please let it be the passion and determination behind this cause to create better lives. From Catherine to Isabel and all across the world, it's, we all do this with a greater intention in mind, and it's so that our friends, our families, our neighbours, our nations, our environment can thrive and flourish without having to be bearing brunt of inequalities and environmental degradation so that we can all continue to live happy and healthy lives. And I think that's the thing that's always captured me the most about this cause, is that, um, I, I mean, I talk about Catherine all the time, but Catherine's amazing, and I got involved in this because I first heard her speak, and it is about that, it's about removing the power structures of it and really putting this down to humanity is what we all need and I'm so excited to be here so thank you.
Thank you, Denisha. Uh, thank you for speaking so eloquently about uh, the intersectional issues. And so now I bring us on to our third speaker, Anna Fielding. Anna is chair of the Economic Change Unit, a nonprofit catalyzing the shift to a more resilient, secure and just economy. Anna is also a strategist, coach and non-executive director working for economic systems change, a trustee of the New Economics Foundation as well, a co-optee at the Joseph Brown Tree Foundation and an associate of the Institute for Social Banking as well as a fellow for the RSA. From 2015 to 2020, Anna was CEO at the Finance Innovation Lab, a pioneering charity building a financial system that serves people and the planet. And I had the pleasure of being a fellow at the lab when Anna was CEO. Anna, over to you. Oh, wow. Thanks, Pat. And thanks for going through the full list as well. That was great. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for having me. Um, my name's Anna. I am a white, middle-class, cisgender, queer, disabled, bipolar woman. Uh, and my work is dedicated to shifting the structures that hold our current unfair and unsustainable economy in place. And, and this work is about all of us because we can't fix society's biggest problems if we don't fix the economy, but it's also really personal to me. And I'm going to describe some experiences that have shaped me in my work and, and they're unique to me just as yours are to you, but I hope that some of what I share will resonate with you. And I did want to flag that I'm going to mention mental illness and trauma, so if these things might be difficult for you, then feel free to, to chew me out for the next couple of minutes. So for as long as I can remember, I've had an absolute determination to kind of name and stand up for what I think is right. And that's just who I am as a human. Um, and I do not mean that I'm a saint or even a vaguely good person, <laughs> just that I've always had that core of strong will and I guess what you would call a commitment to justice. And that strong will is super strong. And that's a problem if you're female, or at least it's a problem for other people. So when I was 10, I was held back from class by my teacher and given a really lengthy dressing down for being bossy. And I'm not going to revisit the situation that led to this, partly because I can't fully remember it, partly because it doesn't matter. But what I do remember and what matters is the feeling of shame and confusion of being told not to be confident in who I was and, and what I could do. And I really, really, really dislike the word bossy. Bossy is what we call girls and women who lead with passion and authority especially those that don't go along with the status quo, who have dangerous ideas that could threaten the people who hold power. And that to me is what wellbeing economics is actually. It's an idea and a movement that would mean that the elite could no longer monopolize resources and power at the expense of everyone else. That's a dangerous idea and that's why I love it. And after that experience, I would go on to be damaged by an education system that was all about exam results and conventional success, not about flourishing as a unique person, but about competing against others, producing and consuming rather than participating in creating. Now, this and other factors led me to develop a serious mental health condition in my teens. And this was the point where I learned that our world wasn't just lacking in justice, it was lacking in care. So in 1997, the year I was admitted, somewhat against my will, to a mental hospital, the UK had world-leading GDP growth and productivity. We had a trade surplus. Great Britain was booming, but we could not care for the people in our society who were deeply distressed in plain sight. What is the point of an economy that prioritises directionless, meaningless growth over the well-being of those it should serve? And I didn't get the care I needed and the treatment I received was deeply traumatic. And I can't begin and subject subjected to an explanation of the pain it caused me, but I can tell, me, tell you that it damaged my relationships, my education, my economic security, my career options, my life expectancy. What saddens me even more is the fact that my privilege as a middle-class white woman enabled me to make it through this far. So when I dropped out of education and jobs, I could try again. When I experienced breakdowns, I wasn't perceived to be a threat and sectioned or tasered or worse. My family had the money to support me when I couldn't cope on my own. But is it right that the fault lines in our economy dictate whether or not we have a chance of surviving? 
well, I did survive and I keep surviving. And I'm sure that that stubborn determination helped me because there were and there still are a lot of bumps in the road. And in my 20s and early 30s, I worked for a range of charities that wanted to see more justice and care in the world. But it took me nearly a decade to realize that underpinning all of the problems that I'd worked on, climate change, inequality, education, health, was the fact that our economy is not built to deliver good lives for people. It doesn't serve us and it doesn't respect the planet. More importantly and excitingly, it doesn't have to be that way. People made it and people can change it. Now, why did it take me so long to realize this? Well, it was because I thought economics was boring. I thought it was a set of fixed laws, a bit like gravity. You couldn't see it, you couldn't understand it, but you really don't want to get in a fight with it. And I was scared of finance. I felt stupid when I read about it. But the thing is, I felt stupid because I was made to feel stupid, because the language and the models that economists and financiers use are elaborate devices to obscure the fact that markets, supply and demand, economic laws, they are all made up of people and people have choices and they care about things way more important than profit and share price. And that revelation and the support of some amazing people led me to become CEO of the organization Cat refers to the Finance Innovation Lab, a group of women who believe we can and should transform the financial system into one that serves people and planet, that look to shift mindsets on narratives and norms about what's possible, that look to transform institutions from the inside out, that look to change the rules and regulations that shape the terrain on which the game is played, and that nurtured and grew the seeds of the future system. And all of this, I believe, must be built on a foundation of inner change. The degree to which we can change the world is strongly related to the degree to which we're willing to work on ourselves. And that's an ethos that I've carried through to the work that I do now across a range of projects. You know, it's about choosing to design an economy that centers justice and care, that puts the needs of everyone at its core, not just those who were born lucky. And as a woman, this feels like the most important battle I could be fighting. And I make absolutely no apologies for my determination in fighting it. My call to all of you would be to join that fight. Thank you, Anna, for being so honest in your reflections and why this is such an important topic to you. So on to our full speaker, Noni McQueen. Macrian. And Noni is an educator, creative and new economics organiser. They are co-founder of Decolonising Economics, a grassroots collective working to build a new economy. And a new economy movement that is rooted in racial justice principles and decolonial struggle. Noni's incredible work involves investing in communities of colour who are working to build an economic democracy enabling shared strategizing, resource distribution, and providing expertise. If you want to read Noni's brilliant words, she is published on Galdem, Stir to Action, and Global Justice Now. Noni, over to you. Thank you. Um, first of all, wow, at all the speakers that have gone um, past already, it's really exciting to hear about all the amazing work that everyone is doing, because I'm sure as the speakers know, in lots of economic spaces, these are just not the conversations that we have. Um, it's not that fun, it's not that interesting. And I think that's a really key part of kind of thinking about the well-being economy, as like um, Anna has just said as well, just like, how can we reflect on our experiences of the economy that kind of center our lived experiences as opposed to these overarching stories about how the economy should be and who it works for that I don't remember voting for and I'm not sure if you do too so um, that's the first thing that I wanted to say and for me um, I suppose it is a bit of my lived experience but I mean it is my lived experience but like I'm one thing that really drives me to do the work that I do is just I'm really interested in the dominant narratives that we get told about stuff that just don't make sense. And I feel like when I was younger, I was just being told lots of things that I was just like, I'm just not sure that's true. And you know, the idea that money is real, another thing which is just not true. Um, the idea that there's a gender binary, another thing that's just not true. And I feel like what really drives me to do the work that I do is just kind of unearthing or kind of researching the ways in which lots of the systems that we consider um, as 
existing are actually created and were developed and designed with that in mind. And so at Decolonizing Economics, when we do our workshops, we normally start with like telling people that the word economy directly means the management of home. And I find that definition really, I don't know, it warms my heart sometimes because it makes me recognize that the economy is something that is based on relationships, right? And the relationships that it takes to manage that home. And like I live with my sister and we have lots of, you know, meetings about how we're managing that home. And I kind of like applying the same thing to the dominant or like the world economy as well. And when we think of home, we think of safety, we think of actually like, you know, food, we think of being comfortable and we think of like feelings, right? As opposed to like outcomes and like outputs of stuff. I mean, I mean, having somewhere to sleep is a great outcome. But um, when I think about economy as a management of home, it really, um, I love that definition because then it's like, how then did we end up in a home where so many of the people actually do not have anything way up? So many people that exist in the world actually just don't even have access to the most basic stuff, right? And like the most, you know, security agency and autonomy is just not given to the majority of the population. And then when we think about it like that, we think about how um, our home is currently managed to accumulate wealth for a select few, right? And um, at Decolonizing Economics, we like to start to think about the story of the economy and how it started and like the development of the economic system as we know it today is a direct um, is directly related to slavery and colonialism and slavery started as a result because capitalists were like we need more stuff right i want more stuff and i like the idea of just not having to pay anyone for any and it's just like infinite growth and no cost right but then also that had a huge cost like um when we look at um there's a really great statistic i don't have it because <laughs> this is about i don't know feminist economics do we need statistics but that's another point but then they talk about how like you know in the beginning of the slave trade so many people were killed that it actually changed the like uh what's it called the co2 emissions of the world or whatever and like when we think about that the economy was actually directly started from the mass extermination and genocide of huge populations in the global south i feel like it's what else can we expect the economy to do, right? It exists to create profit at the cost of so many people. And I really like thinking about this as like the extractive economic system, because under capitalism, we tend to think that this is the economic system, but we currently live in an economic system that seeks to extract and to take and to just eat. It's just hungry all the time. And it doesn't recognize that we all have boundaries and we all have um, bits that, yeah, like, there's no such thing as infinite, it's only finite. And also to maintain that relationship of things which are finite, we need to think about how we pour in and how we take out and how we balance that relationship, right? And I've been thinking a lot about when we think about, as Anna was saying as well specifically, like under, oh, one minute to go, okay, cool. When we think about like the well-being economy, I feel like there's a thing about what is on the other side of the story of economics, one that centers people who are at the margins, right? And when we think about the amount of work, unpaid work, unpaid labor, and some things that are not even thought of to be work that women and like non-binary people and gender non-conforming people experience, in, even that considering um, intersectionality, right? When we think about the other side of the story of how people who are disabled and like who live under like a really harsh reality that tells you that you do not deserve care because you don't have money what does that mean about like how we can organize for the well-being economy and I think um one of the main things that I wanted to say is um thinking about like how when we think about the world being economy we cannot understand it without intersectionality and the idea that a lot of these things or alternatives to um, capitalism have already been in existence, but under the dominant story of the economy, all of the ways of like practicing alternative economic policies based on care, based on being a neighbor, based on actually like checking in on people and like from a point of like feeling as opposed to like these numbers of GDP. What, how else can we understand and like reframe the economy? And um, try to think of other stuff. I have more of things to say. And also the ways in which economics is actually embedded in the processes of life all the way to death, right? Who does the work of like birthing? Who does the work of caring for those who cannot afford to live or like those who are dying? It's like women's work. And 
how can we then reframe the things that we can ask from our current economic system with an understanding that it wasn't built for us and how can we empower ourselves to do that that's just me it was a bit of a ramble but that's how I talk so thank you no ramble perfectly said thank you Noni and for painting the picture of how the threads of what happens here in the UK uh, reach out across the globe and vice versa so we are now joined a uh, little head of schedule uh, with Caroline Lucas as she's off uh, for important voting in parliament um, she will be giving us our first set of reflections as our first keynote listener um, in case uh, you are not aware of Caroline's Again, in case you're not aware of Caroline and what, what she's been up to, uh, Caroline is the Green Party's first MP and has represented Brighton Pavilion since 2010. Previously, she served as a member of the European Parliament uh, for 11 years and as Oxfordshire Councillor. She has also served as the Green Party's leader and co-leader. Importantly, she is chair of the all-party parliamentary groups on climate and limits to growth, as well as member of the influential environmental audit committee. And if all of that didn't sound influential enough, um, she is the Environment Agency's top 100 eco heroes of all time and has won awards for her work for doing so. Oh. And additionally, she's passionate about parliamentary reform. So Caroline, over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kat. That's um, that's quite a, an introduction to live up to. Listen, what I wanted to say, first of all, was just to, to thank everybody so much for this session and, and to thank all of our speakers so far. I love the way that it's been organised. I love the, the privileging of, of lived experience. I think it already feels very different from most of the meetings that I ever go to on, on anything, actually, but certainly on, on economics. Um, and, and thank you as well for this whole idea of a, of a keynote listener. Um, I, I feel very privileged to have been asked to, to, to listen to what people are saying and to really reflect on, on that. And I suppose I was going to start with, with one of Catherine's opening comments about daring to ask why. It's interesting, isn't it, how, how asking why can be such a challenge to, to people and how that, that can, can sometimes require courage. But I think one of the things that it made me think about was you know, why all of these different individual campaigns that I'm sure all of us are involved in, whether that's to do with tackling poverty or racism, or whether it's to do with tackling environmental injustice, all of them are so connected by the fact that in many ways they, they, they are symptomatic of this underlying extractive, exploitative economic system that is uh, oppressing all of us in a sense. And, and I think that way in which if we come straight to the issue of a well-being economy, we get to the causes of so many problems in the world today rather than just the symptoms is something that binds together so many of the different campaigns that we're involved in. Um, and if I had a wish right now, I guess it would be that all of those campaigns were to integrate right from the start a strand about the shift to a well-being economy, because it does feel that unless we get that right, then, then all of these other areas that we're involved in that, that absolutely you know, urgently need change, that they're never going to actually get to the point where all of us can thrive in harmony with our, with our one very damaged planet. I was struck as well by what Mylena was saying about, about, um, about this stress really in, in, in education and, and universities on, on, on quantity, not quality, um, when, when intrinsic value is, is, is not the most important thing. What is the most important thing is the number of papers published or, or the amount of funding that's been attracted. And you know that sense as well that GDP is doing exactly the same thing. If we measure success of anything just simply by GDP, then, then all we're doing is talking about the amount of money circulating in the economy, not whether or not it's being used for qualitatively positive things. It's shocking, I think, to look at some of the Department of Education's own sort of outcomes of success. And if you look at how the Department of Education um, and universities in particular are to be measured by this government in terms of their success, it actually says in black and white that they are required to drive economic growth. So this growth-based fetish really is, is in every single part of, of, of policy today. I really appreciated what um, Denisha and Anna and Noni were all saying about about intersectionality really and about how none of these issues that we are dealing with can be addressed 
unless they are addressed together. And that in a sense does take us back to the kind of economy that underpins all of them. Um, I think Noni was absolutely right. The, we, s slavery, racism, all of that is to do with capitalism and growth. And Anna put it just so, so powerfully when she says, what's the point of growth if, if, if we've got a system where the care system is broken, where there is so much misery and cruelty? You know, how, how can we possibly be so obsessed in, in growth in its own terms? And it seems clear that the current economic system is a root cause of, of so many of the, of the challenges that we're grappling with. Uh, and as I say, that goes for so many facets of gender inequality as much as for the social and ecological crisis we face as well. And it strikes me from everything that I've heard that gender inequality isn't some kind of unforeseeable, unfortunate, accidental side effect of how the economy operates. It's a direct result of our economic model, which is extractive and exploitative, not by accident, but by design. And the same goes for climate breakdown or biodiversity loss or, or other forms of inequality. These are symptoms of an economic orthodoxy that is dangerously outdated and completely unfit for purpose in the 21st century. And that's not to say that we can achieve gender equality by shifting simply to a well-being economy and job done. Of course not. There are many other factors that need to be addressed too. But it feels so important and timely to be having this conversation today, centering the economic system as, as a root cause of the problem, because until we do, I think it is so difficult to identify or implement the full range of, of solutions and changes that we need. And yes, those solutions can and must include strong laws for equal pay and prevention of discrimination and, and enforcement. Uh, it must include things like the definancialization of the social sector, better parental leave, childcare provision, and so on. The list is long and rightly so. But part of the solution has to go deeper. It is the task of redesigning our economic system to put equality and sustainability at its very core. And that we do need those economic structures, new economic structures, new goals and new values. And to bring it back to the wellbeing petition, and I, I'm, I'm really um, appreciative of, of, of the amount of focus there's been on this petition. That is what this petition is all about. And if we can secure the 100,000 signatures by the end of this month, if we can secure that debate in Parliament, then I have a feeling that many of the most thoughtful contributions um, to that debate probably will come from female MPs, despite the fact that only around a third of current MPs are women. And I think the timing is really important too, with another spending review from the Treasury on the cards this autumn. You know, will the test for what gets the green light for public spending be tackling inequality and the climate crisis, or will it principally be GDP growth? Well, sadly, I think I can answer that question already without waiting to, to wait for the outcome. So today's event and the contributions from the, from the speakers gives me real conviction that we are on the cusp of the change that we, that we need. And even if it's likely to take the UK Treasury a while longer to get there than, than some other finance ministries, notably those nations um, those in the nations of the well-being economy governments partnership. Um, I still think that if we look around, then the leadership we need is absolutely coming less from Westminster, sadly, but it is coming from communities, from civil society organisations, from cities, local authorities, and even some businesses as well. And so I suppose that's what gives me hope that a well-being economy is on its way. Um, Kat explained earlier that uh, very shortly, um, I'm in fact almost now, um, I'm going to have to run away to, to vote on the elections bill. But if I can just make the, the link really with the, the debate that we're having just now, because the elections bill that is being debated in Parliament right now is a blatant attempt by government to rig the system. It is a dangerous assault on democracy and on fundamental rights. And one of the things that would do this elections bill would be essentially to allow the government to decide which campaigns, which civil society organizations can actually have the, the, the political space to, to campaign in the future. So it feels as if it is all interconnected. So I am so sorry not to be able to be with you until the end of, of the session, but um, it, all of it is interconnected. And I, and I guess having to rush off to vote on the elections bill demonstrates that as well. Thank you so much, Caroline, for staying with us as long as you can and uh, for your reflections and reminder of why the petition matters and the impact it really could stand to have. Good luck with tonight's vote. So we are now have reached that point of the evening where we want to open 
things up to hearing your stories about how we can build a new economy that meets the needs of all beings and the planet, and why female and non-binary leadership is important in that transformation. For audience members who identify as men or male, we ask you to share your stories of your experience of gender in the economy and how have masculine norms impacted you. I'll now hand you over to Isabel to take it from here. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. So we are gonna use a tool called Mentimeter. Um, so if you all can go to menti.com and I'm just gonna pull it up here. So if you go to menti.com and you input the code that's at the top here, which I will copy and paste into the chat, um, you'll be able to answer this question, I might need someone else to copy it. Well, yeah, I'll just do this part. Um, and then all of your answers will show up on the screen and then we can view them together. Oh, why is voting closed? One moment, I apologize. It should not be closed, sorry. Um, okay. There we go. Does anyone have any questions? So if you if all are reading some of these, um, quite interesting, and we'll have these recorded down and shared, um, just stories of all these experiences of each of us. And to mirror or reflect back what we're seeing here, some of these stories uh, concern being paid uh, less uh, than uh, peers um, and feeling marginalized or in promotions. Um, others have been uh, res how the speakers have resonated uh, with your own experiences, um, feeling that uh, you too have been uh, called bossy. Um, Others about how you felt you've had to work harder to get places, um, uh, maybe believing that you don't understand economics, but we hope by this evening this is not true. Everybody has a lived experience of economics. Um, and then undiagnosed of medical needs and how there's a bias in the medical system and, and actually there's a, 
a relationship there with the economic system, uh, then it can feel really uh, difficult and pressurized to be uh, the primary caregiver um, at home and also to be working at the same time, whatever the family unit may be. And then actually what uh, has happened during COVID and, and remote working and actually, although that might have provided opportunities for many that actually uh, some are feeling disadvantaged by that situation through their experience of, of being female or from their non-binary perspective. I think we have a few more moments with this question and we'll, we have a second one, one for you as well. Thank you for your honesty, everybody. These stories really do paint a strong collective picture as well as giving important individual detail. I'm gonna give just one more minute and then we'll go to the next screen. Okay, so the next question is share one hope for what could be different for women in a well being economy. And if you keep on your screen and use the same code, it's going to work just the same. Okay, so to share some of these hopes that are coming through, uh, never doubt yourselves, never doubting ourselves, uh, feminist town planning, uh, to value our caring values, and that includes respect and equality, and, and going further with equality, equality of pay, pensions, and working conditions. And this next one is not only for women, but for all humankind to be respected and being treated as equal humans. And that there is another way of doing economy uh, or economics. And, and, so, and many of those have been mentioned uh, tonight. And one referenced here is uh, Kate Ray Weston on economics. Uh, another hope is that there is a greater focus we put on care, well being, and love. And it's actually seen as an important and ultimate goal of our society, not some soft add on and that this should be taken seriously. And that women's care work is valued and that women are safe from male violence. And I think that I imagine others are saying here, this is going across groups as well, that we look to multi-dimensional solutions that we don't work against or in spite of menstrual problems and what are just seen as problems, that there's greater acceptance and that, that we'd love to see all being fairly treated, rivers, trees, as other than humans, as well as men and women, that is humans. To be paid for currently unpaid emotional labour and caring for family, friends and children. That we are listened to and life experience is more important than qualifications. Having a baby certainly doesn't mean you're incapable. Being able to start a career without massive debt. And more about equality here, equal care, responsibility, so that there is no detriment after maternity leave. And that women and non-binary people are the ones leading the change. That change is collaborative. And that um, thinking to the future that uh, a child of ours may be more equally valued in the future than, than currently so. Uh, there's also about parenting being viewed and rewarded as work. Perhaps universal basic income comes in here. Um, an economy centered on compassion 
um, that we abandon gender roles, allow for true collaboration between all members of the community in the effort to achieve a comfortable living and experience life as a pleasant experience, that we are compensated for the time spent in caregiving. And this means valuing our children, valuing our parents and making this conversation available to, across um, groups, men or women or otherwise. Mm -hmm and that there is security or at least less insecurity around the context of climate uh, breakdown. These are just such wonderful reflections. I'm gonna ask Isabel to uh, step in uh, if, I, if I'm uh, running myself over time, reading out your, your wondrous train of thought here and your hopes. Shall I carry on, Isabel? Um, go, yeah, keep going. Just so, I think just a couple more minutes and I'm, I'm just scrolling and- um, Wonderful. Yeah. We'll have a Q and A. So you're doing fantastic. Q and A. Okay, so that all work will be recognised is part of redefining paid and unpaid work by other means than solely a monetary currency. And uh, that our communities are better valued, and this includes community building, and not what was just seen as work work. And um, the recognition of value added to society by unpaid caring. Again, that this is important, and uh, think topically. Actually, there's a lot of um brilliant documentaries coming up about that very soon um, that equal and feel equal um, that growth is a form of growing solidarity love power and access especially for the global south and recognition that women begin life paying taxes in odious debt to capitalism uh, people are valued for their diversity not hindered for it um, that two partners raising children, oh, and that's just scrolled past me, so I will move on. So that older women and men are valued. We see the wisdom. We allow some communities and indigenous people to live life differently. Uh, coming back to the two partners raising children, that they're able to balance childcare commitments and with their work career fulfillment, so that there isn't this divide between a, a, bread, a bread earner. Um, having the woman's perspective included in the new narrative in such a natural way that women don't need to perform to adapt to the system, rather be part of the construction of the new system. And that we truly value each of us, whether our age, gender or ability. And that we are no longer seen as a version of default human male, but both male and female are seen entirely equal without gender or stereotypes that we are not written off as uninteresting and boring if we take time off for caregiving. And I think just to finish, that we lose gender roles and experience them in a centering of life and policy in norms, in law, in love, and to appreciate that women are not adjacent, but are central to the global community value and work. I thank you so much for your words, it's truly powerful, thank you. And just so that everyone's aware, we will be um, writing a follow-up blog tomorrow where we can well, we'll share some of these stories so you all can reflect on them. It will be, um, yeah, for the public. So the last part of the webinar and Mentimeter, um, or not total last part, but the next part is a Q&A. Um, and so this is also gonna be done here. So if you, everyone can ask a question and then you can vote on those questions. So we'll let kind of the questions pour in and it will um, self kind of organize so we can prioritize the questions based on, based on the audience. Um, is everyone able to access this on their Mentimeter online? Is it working? And just to add to this there, if you see the thumbs up icon, uh, which is below the question that's currently up on Isabel's screen, this allows you to vote for questions you like. So the power is in your hands to upvote uh, your fellow audience members' questions uh, in terms of what you think uh, should get answered by both our speakers and our keynote listeners. And just whilst you are putting in your questions and thinking that through, Isabel. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing the screen as I'm going to allow um, Mandy. Fantastic. Thank you, Isabel. So uh, we will now get a second set of reflections from our second keynote listener, Mandy Reed. 
Mandy Reid is leader of the Women's Equality Party, uh, becoming in April 2019 the first person of colour to lead a national political party in British history. She's currently leading the party's campaign in response to the coronavirus crisis. Prior to this, she spent over a decade working at City Hall for all three mayors of London and is also founder of The Cup Effect, a charitable social enterprise advocacy and campaigning organisation that tackles period poverty in the UK and globally. In 2019, Mandu was recognised by Apolitical as one of the top 100 influential people in global gender policy. To put this in context, this happened alongside Michelle Obama, Melinda Gates and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, amongst others. Mandu, over to you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Fantastic. Yes, we can. Uh, first of all, um, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this wonderful conversation. When you look at how public discourse is kind of taking place um, at the moment, it's so important that we carve out opportunities and hold space for conversations like this, hold space for voices that too often are kind of marginalized and sidelined because it's our voices and it, it is our kind of contributions that hold so many of the solutions and ideas that could get us out of the mess we kind of find ourselves in um, at this early part of the 21st century. I mean, where to start with what we've heard so far? I, um, I'll put a spotlight just to kick things off on, on, on what Noni said. Um, some of you will know uh, on this call, I predict most of you won't, that um, Noni's, their name, uh, the, Noni's full name is Nonchantla. And um, certainly where I grew up and where I come from, uh, that loosely translates into English as lucky or woman of fortune. Now, when I look at what following slavishly GDP has done, I really see being beholden to GDP as a betrayal, a particularly a betrayal of the younger generations, women like Noni, women younger than her, uh, younger than them too, it is a betrayal. Look where it has led us. And I wanna really zoom in on the price that women and non-binary people too have paid given the situation that we're in now following on from um, 18 months of, of a pandemic situation. Our economy as it stands, neglects, overlooks, undervalues, ignores uh, the contribution that women make. Look what happened during the coronavirus. We were the, the height of the crisis. We were dependent on our social infrastructure. We were dependent on our healthcare sector, our social care sector, and our childcare sector. Now, those sectors are overwhelmingly propped up, overwhelmingly uh, run by women. 77% of the healthcare uh, workforce are women. 83% of the social care workforce are women. 92% of the childcare workforce are women. And when we find ourselves in a time of crisis, those are the portions of our economy that we lean on. And so for me, so much of what came through when we were doing the Mentimeter sharing really reinforces how it makes absolutely zero sense to disregard and overlook those contributions. Women's unpaid care work uh, in our economy um, contributes, and this is a very modest uh, estimation, 77 billion pounds worth of, of labor every single year to our um, nation's bottom line. And so if you extracted that out of, of uh, the economy as it stands, we'd find ourselves in a situation where everything quickly grinds to a halt. And so this opportunity, the promise, the potential of reframing um, how we look at the economy, I think gives us a chance of um, doing, getting back onto a corrective course so that uh, you know, young people don't have to inherit the damaging consequences of hundreds of years worth of um, kind of focus solely on a, a GDP side economy. We need a caring economy. And a lot of uh, the other contributors spoke about the necessity of changing the frame. I couldn't agree with that more because when you look at it, 
If we did that, we would make such different decisions. If our starting point when deciding how to allocate resources, what decisions to make, decisions like like the decisions we heard about today uh, with the government's announcement uh, for what to do with the crisis for social care. We would make completely different decisions if, if our starting point moved on from who or what is gonna profit to hang on a minute. If we go down this path, who or what is gonna be exploited? Who or what will suffer? Who or what will be disadvantaged if we take this course of action? Now, having well-being as the frame and zooming in on uh, the contribution that women in particular make to our economy allows us to be in a situation where actually, when a crisis like the pandemic hits us, we are better able to manage it. We are better able to shore up the quality of life and prospects for everyone involved. Um, somebody mentioned uh, when we did the Mentimeter that uh, one of the things they had a deep desire for was a feminist approach to town planning. Now, people might scratch their heads and think, hang on a minute, um, what on earth does that have to do with, with, with anything? Well, I personally think that when you look at um, examples from elsewhere, there's a place, I don't know how many of you have heard of it, called Aspern in Vienna. And it is a massive district of their city. And what they did, this was several decades ago, starting from scratch, they designed the whole area using the experience of women as their basis. Most cities, most public transport systems are designed with a one size fits men approach in mind, driven by how our economy works. Men are at home in the outskirts of the city, they drive in or, or travel into the center of the city to do their work. Women maneuver around cities in very different ways because of the different distribution of labor that we have um, and the responsibilities we have within that. Now in Aspern, they designed taking the experience and lifestyle of women as their starting point. And long story short, I could talk about this all night. What they have done is that they have created an environment which has one of the highest qualities of living of any city region, any urban area in the world by simply changing the frame. So while we're trying to make the case for all this stuff, I don't think in this room, we need to persuade ourselves of the moral arguments for it, but you know what? Those who want a business case, there is a business case. We, it has been shown that if you invest in, the, in care, you will create three times as many jobs than if you invest in traditional ways of trying to uh, you know, jumpstart an economy like construction. And those care jobs are green jobs and they are good for the economy and they are jobs that would actually uh, give greater value to one of the things that we know supports our interconnectedness, our relationship with, with each other and our quality of life. And so I think the opportunity is absolutely massive. What we need to do uh, I, together, I was asked to consider one of the some give some offer some ways forward. I want you to sign the petition. I want you to put it on your Facebook tonight. I want you to tell your friends to sign it. I want you to tell them to get five of their friends to sign it. We need before the next big budget uh, review in spring next year to have had this conversation in Parliament. So that's step one. And another thing that we'll be doing in the Women's Equality Party, and it's a cross-party thing because that's how we roll. So Green, Tory, Labour, Lib Dem, I don't care. Anyone can be involved. We'll be launching something called the WEP Academy. And the idea there is to give people the confidence, particularly women, of course, the vocabulary and um, the sort of content they need to advocate powerfully for these ideas. We want to help women find their voice, find their power and find each other because it's our collective power that's going to be needed in order to shift the dial on this and make these ideas as popular as they need to be for politicians to take notice. Somebody wanted a statistic. Uh, let me see what that is. Is it something I said? Hold on. Ah, uh, yes. So um, it's the women's budget group who did this analysis. And then I promise I'll stop. Um, it's the women's budget group who did this analysis. And essentially, if you invest X amount into care versus X amount into construction, you will create three times as many jobs by investing in care than you would by investing in construction. And those jobs are green jobs. 
and they are jobs that would shore up our society and enable more uh, women who want to, to offer their talents to the workforce, to contribute, uh, pay taxes, not be on benefits, boost the economy as a whole. And it's that kind of thinking. When you look at things from a well-being perspective and a feminist lens, you can move the dial so that society as a whole benefits. But it takes us, uh, and I don't say us, it would take the government having the courage to, uh, you know, disappoint some of their vested interests. Been done before though. Anyway, that's all from me for now. Brilliant, Mandu, and drop the mic. Thank you. Very, very powerfully said, reflecting it all back. I'm gonna hand you over to Isabel, who's now bringing up our uh, highlighting, spotlighting our, uh, our speakers and our listeners, and uh, we'll be fielding questions. Yes, so I am just gonna bring everyone onto the screen. Um, and we have 21 questions. Um, so we probably will not be able to get through all of them, but we will do our best. Let me just check, make sure I'm not missing anyone. Um, lovely. So the first question, and I'll copy and paste these into the chat, um, is, what concrete initiatives are in place that you know of that are working toward these ends and have they resulted in real concrete change? So I'm going to ask, um, I'll start with Noni. If you have a response to that question, you can say, you can, you can pass the mic, but I'm gonna try to make sure that we, everyone's able to speak. Um, do you wanna take that one? Um, so that's a really big question. And I think sometimes when people ask that question, it's like, what are the, um, you know, the idea of what progress looks like sometimes can go back to ideas of like how capitalism sees progress. So I always think when I, people ask me this question, I think like on the small scale of the ways in which I see people in my community, like um, responding to each other's needs and care. And for me, a lot of that has been through um, cooperatives um, and how like, um, yeah, communities of color, especially those who are like women and those who are like gender non-conforming have created like cooperatives to support each other. And, um, and yeah, on the small scale and like off the top of my head, there's this amazing um, collective called um, the Black Unicorn Cooperative. And last year they managed to collectively um, fundraise um, and like share a, um, a pot of money that went to paying like the rent and like the most basic needs that lots of people in the queer community don't have access to. And, you know, I feel like under like, you know, in public policy, it's like, well, people's rent isn't important, but people's daily lived expenses are so often overlooked as to how we think about care and well-being and we know that lots of people are stressed because they don't have enough money to afford to live so for me it's always like cooperatives are thinking about how to um yeah instead of that being an individual problem that for being a collective issue and also just to plug, plug decolonizing economics um, um last month we did a couple of events um, which were talking about economics from the margins, right? And then we had an event um, on care and the economy. We had one on like queerness and the economy. And then we had another one on like reparations and the economy as well. And one way that I've really seen that's really interesting is the ways in which people that have wealth have been like redistributing towards like um, gendered like needs um, and especially like things around like prison abolition as well and like accountability, right? And there's ways there's lots of harm in the community and like one of the groups that I've seen is like cradle community and then they really take a lot of the things that we're talking about now of like compassion and care and like support and like they kind of place that within a political framework of like how then can we ask and respond to gender-based violence and I've seen and I think that is an economic issue right people don't really think that issues of gender-based violence and like domestic violence are economic concerns but like economic abuse is like a massive thing that happens and also that happens, um, gender-based violence often happens because of systems of patriarchy and like classism as well. So I, um, two people I'd, I'd recommend, Cradle Community and um, Black Unicorn Collective. Thank you so much. Um, the next question, yes, Mandu, 
Go oh, no, it. no, don't. There was a lot of questions. So if you want to get through them and move on. I was going to go to you next, actually. And this one, oh, okay. I'm going to ask you and Catherine to both answer. Okay. Um, okay. So the, the question is, apart from signing the petition, what is the very first action you want to see taken? <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> Amanda, you kick off. No, it's uh, the problem is there's um, there's a hell of a lot that needs to be done. Um, I'm going to link this to uh, what now one of the other contributors said, and I think what we need to have are we need to multiply the um, number and quality of advocates we have for these ideas. And one of the other uh, speakers spoke about how. Um, sure, we got to change the world, but that's got to happen in tandem and in parallel with us also working on ourselves. And so I think um, a really, really valuable and worthwhile thing that doesn't happen enough, particularly in public discourse at the moment, is um, just trying to, as I, as, I, as I alluded to, boost your kind of your own confidence and knowledge of some of these principles. And um, I can give you like a kind of line of inquiry. If we want to look at, um, and this links to the previous question that was asked, um, I think a really wonderful way of in illustrating the power of, of feminist economics, which overlaps massively with well-being economics, is by looking at the care system. And a lot of people um, initially think I'm a bit crazy when I say it would be transformational for our economy and our society if we introduced uh, proper shared parental leave and free universal childcare from the end of parental leave up to age five. People say that sounds really lovely, but it's not affordable. How the hell are we gonna pay for it? And this is what, this is, I'm gonna give you a small example. And then I think my task uh, for you is to find other examples and explore what's out there. What, it, what that does, if you have that policy in place, you it pays for itself within five years because you unlock the potential of so much greater proportion of your workforce, not just their potential as labor and to be productive, but their talent and their ideas and their perspectives. Because you have more women who are currently frozen out of the workforce because of the way childcare and parental leave work in this country. We have the most expensive childcare in Europe. And you have more people because of that circumstance actually claiming benefits. So there's a really, really simple example of how a different approach is actually materially better for society, even though we know that the material benefits are only marginal. We don't, we don't care only about those, we care also about the well-being impacts. So sign the petition and try and get as comfortable and as confident and as knowledgeable as you can about some of these things. So you can help make the case, advocate in your community and support the work Caroline and others are trying to do uh, in the corridors of power to help these ideas gain and maintain traction. Go ahead, Catherine. Thank you, Mandu. <laughs> so did we mention there's a petition that you should all sign and then get everyone to, that you know to sign up because we've got a window of opportunity to help all politicians at Westminster start to take this seriously because they'll sense that there's a bit of a groundswell around this so piling on that but my answer is pretty similar to Mandu's this is about sparking those conversations kick open this discussion when you're hearing things on the news say to the person sitting next to you well why is that what's the upstream cause of that why are we so obsessed with GDP and I just want to finish with this so much of the economy thrives on the backs of women particularly women of colour, and the fact that it doesn't acknowledge, let alone pay those debts, would be illegal if it was an individual business. This would be called trading while insolvent. So we've got to call this out. The fact that our economy is standing and on the shoulders, operating on the backs of women and not paying those obligations, not recognizing that. And perhaps maybe there's a you know, legal case, I don't know if any lawyers here, but maybe we use some of that insolvency law to batter down this assumption, this letting the economy keep going while not recognizing the foundations on which it stands. That's more than enough for me as well. Great, okay. I'm gonna try to get through a couple more here. So I'm gonna put this one to Denisha. If you were prime minister, what would your first move be to transform to a well-being economy? 
That's such a big question. Um, I think I'll start by I would be first minister, not prime minister, less to solve. Um, but yeah, uh, I think the first thing that I would do is I would ask myself, what I'd ask everyone around me is what sort of country do you want to live in and what should it look like? And I think the thing that comes to mind for me is that whole idea that there's nothing about us without us policy making. So how do we make sure that the people we have around the table are people of colour, are women, are LGBT, have different abilities, different perspectives, lived experience of poverty, all these sorts of things. I would probably start by scrap, like just pretty much saying the people in the room need to be people that have lived experience of what isn't working well. So poverty food banks and get them all in, get them into politics, get them to have the say over what needs to change. Because I feel like I've got a worldview um, and I know what I think about certain issues, but even the issues I'm passionate about, I still have a privilege, I still have a platform. Being LGBT and being a woman, being here today, that's still a platform, that's still privilege. There's other women, there's other LGBT people that don't have the same right to advocate for what they want to see changed. Um, and that's particularly relevant for trans people and non-binary people. I can speak on behalf of how much the LGBT community means to me and how much I think policy needs to shift and how we need to become a more tolerant and accepting society. But actually, we need a wider perspective of LGBT, LGBT people. Um, and I think that's what I would do for everything. I think it's not about how I would change everything, being in that position of power, but how I would make the playing field more level and make sure that everyone has a ability to make a change. Um, thanks for all the... I'm not going to run for FM. Sorry, Jane. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I would do. I think that's the most important. I think for too often we've had a few people making the decisions about everyone and those people aren't people that are diverse in their thinking and I think that's the first thing I would change is I flip that on its head and overcome those power structures because it needs to be a well-being economy is about us all not the few. We do have a couple votes in the crowd thank you um, and my last question is going to be from Melina. Um, when feeling trapped by the capitalist economy where do we start with action against it? Oh gosh thank you for the question again a really big question um and yeah definitely because you know i think i think the main thing or the first thing is probably just to get support and support from mind like um uh, like like-minded people and often they are in our positions they are women um but they can also be men you know i <clears throat> i quite like to highlight that actually i think changing men's positions in society um and in the economy is just a really important part of that and 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 getting that support it's just incredibly important um, and yeah just to give you some you know a couple of personal examples um, my dad for example was house husband you know when I was small and so I've grown up with this idea that yes actually that can be a man's role a man's role and that is perfectly fine and yeah and he's supporting me still you know when I when I get nervous to speak at an event like this or uh, have some other stresses going on um, yeah, and you know, having a partner who um, is incredibly supportive of me being the main earner, and um, yeah, and um, I guess with all the stresses that come with the job. So yeah, um, so getting support, I guess, is one of the things. Um, um, I think, I mean, people have, you know, everyone has said so many in incredibly important things about how we can network all the great organizations that are out there that already do fantastic work to to uh, basically promote this agenda and if we can somehow um, join these organizations and, and and show them support maybe try to see whether we can contribute somehow that could be another way that is actually really empowering um, and and basically then has also more impact on on how the economy is being run uh, overall so yeah just some um, so, you know, just a couple of thoughts here. Thank you so much. Um, Kat, I'm going to bring you into the spotlight to close us out. Thank you all. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you all for staying a little over time. Well, it will be uh, by the time I've brought things to a close. And a huge thank you to all our inspiring speakers, Milena Books, Anisha Kilo, Anna Fielding, Noni Macriana, for highlighting the importance of lived experience in understanding our economy and the economy we want to move towards. 
Thank you also to our wondrous keynote listeners, Caroline Lucas and Mandy Reed, for reflecting back this evening's conversation so succinctly and in many ways as a call to action. Our thanks too to Catherine Trebek for her pithy intro to the wellbeing economy and joining in the Q&A. And a gigantic thanks to you, the audience, for your curiosity and passion for this topic and sharing your story so openly and beautifully. Just to remind you, again, as of this afternoon, the petition is up to nearly 55,000 signatures. 100,000 signatures are needed by the 26th of September to trigger a major Commons debate. Anyone who is a UK resident or citizen can sign up. If you haven't signed the petition already, you know what to do. And recruit, recruit, recruit others to sign it too. After this evening, you have everything you need to advocate for why it's important. As Mandy said, our collective power really matters. We are grateful for the stories you have shared here today uh, by our speakers, keynote listeners and participants and audience members. As Isabel has mentioned, we all will be following up this event with a blog and we will do our best to answer any unanswered questions that came through tonight. So remember three things. One, sign the petition. Two, go to wheel.org. And three, follow We All Alliance on Twitter, as well as following all our wonderful speakers and listeners on Twitter and other social media platforms as well. Thank you to Laura and Lisa who've been sharing all these links as we go. Um, if I have missed anybody out in the thanks, I am deeply apologetic. And other than that, I will say thank you again and have a wonderful rest of the evening. Thank you.